A huge stash of weapons found in Italy with neo-Nazi sympathizers. The Italian government says the seizure is unprecedented. So how significant is this and what does it tell us about the re-emergence of Nazism and the far-right movement in Europe? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. An arsenal of weapons has been seized by Italian police in a raid on a far-right group. Authorities say the incident is significant and almost without precedent. The stockpile was discovered during an investigation into the involvement of Italy's far-right movement in the conflict in eastern Ukraine. And it included an air-to-air -air missile, rocket launchers, and automatic rifles described as latest generation. Neo-Nazi propaganda material was also seized. Police have arrested three people, including a former candidate for the neo-fascist Forza Nuova party. Fabio del Bergiolo's house was found to contain a huge stash of arms, as well as Hitler memorabilia. Europe has experienced an increase in the popularity of right-wing groups in recent years. Much of their rhetoric is based around national populism and attacks on migrants and Muslims. And they've gained more ground with the rise of far-right political parties in European parliaments. Right-wing movements have held protests against immigration and Islam in several parts of Europe. And violent attacks have been carried out by far-right activists, including neo-Nazis and white supremacists. Germany's domestic intelligence agency, the BFV, says there are more than 24,000 far-right extremists in the country and believes almost half are potentially violent. In France, 10 people suspected of planning attacks on mosques, Muslim leaders, and women wearing veils were arrested last year. And in the UK, the European Union's law enforcement agency Europol says five right-wing terror plots were recorded in 2017. Well, let's bring in our guests now to talk more about this. In Pescara, Italy, via Skype, we have Italian journalist Stefano Vergin. In Lisbon, we have Michal Bilovic. He is the chair at the Center for Research on Prejudice at the University of Warsaw. And in New York, also via Skype, we have Ludovica Di Giorgi. She is the manager of the far-right program at the social enterprise group Moonshot countering violent extremism. Good to have you all uh, with us. So, uh, Stefano, let me start with you. How significant is this development, do you think, this seizure um, of, of these missiles uh, that uh, appear, to be, uh, appear to have been acquired by this neo-Nazi group in Italy? Well, according to, to the Italian police, the anti-terrorism police is one of the most significant seizure in the history of Italy. Uh, it is significant as uh, it involves uh, neo-Nazi, neo-fascist groups, and one of the three people arrested um, used to be a candidate for a political party in Italy, a neo-fascist political party called Forza Nuova. Um, I have to say Forza Nuova released a statement right after the arrest, uh, distancing itself from, from this guy whose name is Fabio del Bergiolo. How, how significant is it then in, in terms of the, the, uh, the larger far-right movement, not just in Italy, but throughout Europe then? Is there, is there a, a connection there? So far, we cannot say anything about this because the police didn't say any, anything about connections with, with other groups. What is sure is that the investigation started um, uh, because the police was investigating on Italians who had fought alongside... Russian-backed separatist forces in eastern Ukraine, namely the Donbas region. Um, so it might have some connections with the other people fighting there, this from a logical perspective. It's quite interesting on, on a political basis in Italy, as Forza Nuova and other neo-fascist groups, political parties, have pretty much the same ideology as the it Italy's ruling party at the moment, which is the League, headed by Matteo Salvini, if you look at the political programs of 
Forza Nuova, Casa Pound, and the league, they're pretty much the same. Michal Bilevich, how serious is this uh, seizure, do you think? Uh, I think this, this uh, problem is uh, relatively uh, important and significant in the whole Europe. And, uh, for example, the party Forza Nuova, the right-wing extremist party in Italy, with whom those people that were found today were connected, um, this party has very strong connection also to the Polish uh, far right, and they have been present uh, almost every year at the, uh, at the rallies of the Polish uh, right-wing uh, extremist uh, uh, parties, the, the independence marches in November that we have every year. So uh, you see that these connections are relatively close. And last year, the Polish president was participating in one, one of these marches. So you could see that they are coming very, very close to the mainstream politics. And also in many countries, for example, in, um, in Eastern Europe, they are closely connected to football hooliganism. And uh, football stadiums are places where uh, much of this mobilization of radicalized far right happens. Uh, Ludovica Giorgi, now the authorities have been tracking many of these far-right movements across uh, Europe, and there has always been this concern uh, that it could spill over into real violence. Is this evidence uh, of that with, with the seizure of, uh, of these weapons, or is this, is this just an exception? Is this the one-off, do you think? Um, so I don't feel like these can be classified as an exception. There is substantial evidence that the threat of white nationalism, far-right extremism is growing not just across Europe, but in other countries, including the United States, for example. So according to the, to the Global Terrorism Index, the number of attacks uh, has increased. Uh, for example, in the 13 years prior to 2014, there were 20 attacks. But in the three years prior to 2017, 61 attacks were recorded. Uh, the UK Channel Programme has uh, recorded an increase of 300 percent of referrals related to white nationalism since 2012, um, as compared to an 80 percent increase in jihadism cases. So this is an evolving terror threat. This is, uh, this is not an exception. Uh, they're operating increasingly decentralized uh, networks. And even if we're talking about a small number of perpetrators so far that have matched this kind of activity with uh, real world violence, they, they have propensity for high impact attacks and, and should be monitored accordingly. Stefano, if I could turn back to you uh, on this, and I'll uh, just broaden this out a bit, and I want to ask you a little bit more about how you believe this may or, be, may, or may not be connected with uh, the rise of, 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 uh, of far-right movements in, in Italy uh, in general, which we have seen in, in the politics in, in Italy, uh, in, in, in its government, and in the recent European elections. Well, uh, yes, let me stick to the facts. So uh, this guy, the guy arrested, uh, Del Bergiolo, is a former officer of the Italian Customs and Border Protection Agency. Uh, he was one of Forza Nuova's candidates in 2001 at the Italian Senate. Um, in his house, police found large amounts of weapons and neo-Nazi, neo-fascist symbols, such as pictures of Mussolini and Hitler. Um, so going to the political uh, issue, um, on the other hand, we have to notice that Forza Nuova national leader, Roberto Fiore, who used to be a member of the European Parliament, was sentenced in the 80s by an Italian tribunal for armed band and terrorism. Um, this party, Forza Nuova, along with Casa Pound, these are the two main fascist parties in Italy. As I was mentioning before, if you look at the, their political programs, they are very similar. They are both nationalists. They both want to stop migrants to come to enter Italy. Uh, they are very uh, traditionally Catholic. They say Islam wants to invade Europe. They are against abortion, homosexuality. They are both against the globalization, both against the influence of the USA on Italy, and both in favor, both pro-Russian, let's say. So if you look at the political program of the League, the party headed by Salvini, you will see it's very similar. So what happens at the elections is that these two neo-fascist parties, Casa Pound and Forza Nuova, didn't get, didn't get enough votes to have their representatives elected into the parliament. At the same time, the League got 34% of the votes, which is the biggest result they, they, they ever uh, had. Uh, so according to many Italian political analysts, 
um, most of the neo-fascist voters had, in the end, decided to vote for the League, and this is why the League was able to get 34% of the votes. All right, uh, Michel, if we, if we go beyond Italy for a moment and look at, look at Europe more broadly and the rise of these, of these groups, uh, Stefano brings up a number of issues there that are, that are, are driving this, like immigration, globalization, and so on. Uh, to what extent do you see, do you see this uh, driving the rise of, of, of far-right movements elsewhere in Europe? Yeah, of course. I mean, the, the, these movements uh, put on the agenda the problems of immigration. They are usually very close, closely, uh, very much expressing homophobia and um, negative attitudes towards uh, towards gay people and uh, equal rights for, for, for uh, gay and straight people in the society. So there are some things that are uh, very much common for them. One thing that I think should be mentioned is the connection with Russia. And, uh, of course, when you think about these weapons found in Italy, um, it, I mean, they, they are of no use, probably, in the current uh, uh, political uh, activity of uh, uh, movements and parties like Forza Nuovo in their home countries, but they might be useful uh, for um, their so-called international missions. And unfortunately, we know that in Poland, for example, the far right-wing movement Falanga uh, was active in the fights in Donbas, in the eastern Ukraine, uh, joining the, 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 the Russian, uh, Russian-sponsored forces uh, in that area. And recently, Political Capital Institute in Hungary made a whole list of right-wing extremist uh, uh, politicians in the Eastern Europe who have very close ties to Russia and to the, um, and, and, and to particularly in the context of war, war in Ukraine. So this this context of. of uh, pro-Russianism of this party, which is kind of historically paradoxical because they are uh, neo-Nazis. I mean, they are very much referring to the Nazi, Nazi rhetorics. But uh, the connection with Russia, I think, seems to be also something uh, which is very similar in, in, in many contexts. And the last thing is what uh, already has been mentioned here, the uh, kind of mainstreaming of their ideas into the mainstream right-wing parties. Because, for example, in Poland, um, the right-wing extremist parties are losing popularity. They're not gaining support significantly. But what has really changed is that much of their agenda is now uh, can be now seen in the mainstream. The same is true about Hungary, when it's no longer Jobbik which is proposing the extremist right-wing views, but rather the uh, central right-wing Fidesz is taking their, uh, their ideas. So I would say that their impact on politics is mostly in terms of agenda setting, rather than uh, having their own uh, members of parliament, members of European parliament, or having uh, some power as, as parties, as movements. Uh, you mentioned there the, 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 the Russian connection, Michel, and I just want to explore that a little bit more. Um, what, what, what do you think is Russia's motivation then uh, if they're supporting uh, these groups? Is it, is it more about just trying to sow chaos um, in, in Europe and, and to sort of upset the, the, the European liberal order? Um, it's, it's very hard to discuss motivations uh, behind that, but we can know what's the consequence of that. And the consequence is destabilization of political uh, life in Europe. Uh, it's uh, creating a sense of chaos, and uh, we know that in the sense of chaos, it's much, uh, you, you can much easier um, uh, create an impact on political decision-making, and this might be the potential uh, agenda for the, let's say, Russian influencers in the, in the region. Uh, Ludovica, we talked a lot there about how immigration uh, seems to be driving a lot of this increased immigration in Europe, uh, re resentment towards migrants and so on. But how much has economics uh, played a role uh, in all of this? Uh, because we had, the, we had the, uh, the financial crisis just over a decade ago. Many people in Europe haven't really fully recovered from that. Is, 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 to what extent is that feeding resentment, do you think? Um, I think that economics definitely plays a role, um, especially for certain um, parties or individuals that are in power that might be using uh, economic crisis to further their political ideas. I do think uh, that problematic rhetoric, uh, whether it uses economics or immigration or, or refugees, certainly doesn't help. Uh, the use of certain racist tropes, uh, the reluctance to condemn attacks uh, or events like this one certainly works to embolden these groups. And economics sometimes provide 
provides a useful uh, ground uh, for, for some of these groups to perpetrate their ideas. It's much easier to condemn other groups, uh, minorities, immigrants, especially when there is an economic crisis taking place. Uh, this kind of rhetoric becomes more believable. It gains more traction and for sure increases the support uh, that these groups can find across different countries, whether that's Italy, Eastern Europe or, or the UK. Do you think their popularity, though, uh, Ludovica, has affected mainstream political parties, where, where in many instances they, they seem to be giving ground to them in some areas of, of policy where they, they perhaps wouldn't have done a few, few years ago for fear of, of losing more ground to the far right? So um, it's important to point out that uh, Munch TV, the organization that I work for, um, focuses on, on violent extremism and not just extremism more broadly. And that's, that's actually really important for us, whether that's dealing with the violent far right, whether it's dealing with violent jihadism. We only focus on the violent fringe of the movement. Uh, for sure, the violent fringe of the movement is emboldened by the nonviolent one, uh, which in turn uh, can be influenced and can be made stronger by the use of a particular rhetoric or narratives by political parties. Sure, uh, but uh, let, let, or let, let me put that then to uh, Stefano. Do you think that there is, that this kind of rhetoric has, has kind of seeped into the, uh, the mainstream uh, political parties across Europe in that some of them have adopted uh, some, of the, some of the ideas, the policies of restricting immigration uh, and so on for fear of not, of, of, of losing further support to them? I would say definitely yes, at least in Italy, as I was mentioning before, uh, political programs of, of the neo-fascist parties, the only two we have in Italy um, showing up at the elections, Casa Pound and Forza Nuova, are very similar to the ones of the Italy's leading party at the moment, the League. Uh, I remember there was an investigation by Italian Carabinieri a few years ago, and they recorded uh, a member of an activist for Forza Nuova, a member of Forza Nuova. Um, and he was telling to Roberto Fiore, the leader of the party, well, Roberto, you should go to Salvini and tell him that he's saying exactly the same thing that we've been saying for years. So in this kind of recording, we, we can see exactly what you were mentioning, what you were asking before. So yes, the mainstream party were, were able to digest um, uh, ideologies that were there were uh, something um, that used to be only connected to far right political political parties up to a few years ago, and now these are becoming uh, mainstream ideas. And Michelle, to what extent do you think uh, you you want to you want to chime in there to, to what uh, to what Stefano was saying yeah, first of all? Uh, because. Exactly. Uh, I have an impression that it's also about sometimes a per uh, personal decisions, because recently in Poland we had uh, a person from these right-wing extremist movements incorporated in the national government. Uh, so the, the vice minister of digitalization in Poland is a person who was previously organizing uh, uh, marches of independence, and he had very close contacts to Forza Nuova in Italy. So you can see how, how close are, are these environments, that we have uh, uh, more or less mainstream political party cookies in the Polish parliament, and this party invited Forza Nuova to, uh, to visit uh, the Polish parliament. And uh, uh, these um, connections between the mainstream parties and the uh, extremists uh, is... Um, becoming inc increasingly visible. One thing in terms of uh, agenda and in, in terms of ideology with, which uh, uh, seems to be created by right-wing extremists in Europe and now uh, became prevalent also in the mainstream politics is conspiracy theories. Uh, most of these right-wing extremist parties were built on uh, very strong uh, conspiracy theories about uh, George Soros, about Jewish institutions, about Jewish influences, about uh, uh, liberal, uh, uh, liberal, uh, uh, um, uh, liberal governments uh, conspiring against the people. And now you can see how slowly and slowly uh, these uh, kind of uh, ideas and these kind of theories uh, are getting expressed also by the leaders, uh, uh, such as uh, uh, Kaczynski in Poland or uh, Viktor Orban. Uh, in Hungary, um, and uh, we know that in times of, of uh, turmoil, in, in difficult times, in times of instability, where people lose the sense of control over politics, these conspiracy theories uh, organize their knowledge. They are helpful in restoring the sense of, of security and certainty. 
And maybe this is why these ideas that are created on extreme far right became so prevalent today in, 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 in politics, also in the mainstream politics. I, I want to ask you as well, um, to what extent has, has the internet played a role in all of this, in particular social media in, in fueling the rise of this group? Uh, I mean, one former white supremacist described the internet as a 24-hour hate buffet, the idea that it's always there and it's easily accessible. How, how much of a factor is that? Uh, this is, uh, this is the, the influences of internet activity on uh, such actions are, are obvious. And uh, uh, in many cases, for example, I think it was in case of the Pittsburgh synagogue shooting in the uh, United States and several other attacks of uh, extreme right-wing violence, you could see that these people became radicalized on 4chan, 8chan, or on the uh, radical social media. Uh, but this is true also about the, the mainstream social media like, like, like Twitter, where the uh, debate becomes uh, uh, very much influenced by the pressures from the from the radicalized voices and uh, it seems that much of the uh, of the radicalization currently and we are talking about any form of radicalization but particularly so about the right wing uh, radicalization it happens in the social media and our research shows that people exposed to hate speech on on internet in the end start to generate such language much more often so it is a way to transform people who are uh, relatively tolerant into haters into racist and maybe even into terrorists uh, if such weapons are around if such weapons uh, are accessible to such movements as we could see in Italy uh, Ludovica, you, you represent a group that is trying to counter uh, this movement, particularly, as you said earlier, violent extremism. What are some of the ways that, that you try to do that, that your organization tries to do that? So the, the emergence of new social media platform has allowed uh, violent extremists, violent white nationalist groups to recruit and radicalize at unprecedented rates online. Uh, they're active on major platforms, including Twitter, uh, Facebook, YouTube, uh, also more niche uh, forums, including 8chan and 4chan. They've even created their own uh, platforms when uh, coordinated takedowns have taken place on some of the more mainstream ones. Um, places like Gab, Thornfront was also one of the oldest forums on the internet and it's a white supremacist forums. So the, I, the technology has uh, basically the use of technology by right-wing extremist groups has evolved over the last few years, which of course poses a challenge, but it also sort of presents us with, with an opportunity. And we like to see it very much as an opportunity because um, every individual that is um, coordinating these, uh, this sort of group in the offline space, most of the time has a presence online. And this presence online means that they leave breadcrumbs uh, related to the offline activity a lot of times, either uh, by searching for uh, how to join certain groups or uh, where to buy certain merchandise related to violent extremist groups on, on Google, or whether it's about uh, sharing some of the content that these groups produce or more performative social media platforms. And this presents us with an opportunity because it allows us to, to find them, uh, to reach them and to provide them with the help that they need to actually transition out of extremist movements, whether this is through uh, global counter-messaging campaigns, um, the organization that I work for uh, developed one of these in partnership with, with Google uh, called the Redirect Method, which is based on the idea of using advertising, just like uh, just general commercial companies do, to identify and, and reach individuals online and then redirect them away from violent content and towards more positive counter-narrative material. Uh, down to one-to-one -one interventions where uh, individuals are identified online, they're reached, one-to-one uh, -one conversations are established with them with uh, trained intervention providers, uh, former extremists, therapists and counselors, really whatever the individuals might need uh, to, to make sure that they can successfully transition out of extremist movements. And then once these, uh, this trust, this conversation is established online, uh, the conversation then transitions into the offline space uh, where they're given the support that they need to sort of disengage and, and reintegrate into society. All right, we are going to have to leave it there. Uh, I want to thank all three of you uh, for taking part. Stefano, Virginia. Michal Bilevich and Ludovica Di Giorgi, thanks very much for being on Inside Story. 
And thank you, as always, for watching. Remember, you can see this program anytime by visiting our website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, you can go to our Facebook page, that facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle there is at AJ Inside Story. And from me, Hazem Seeker, and the whole team here, bye for now.